Hello, everybody. So uh, I was invited. So whatever happened is their fault. <laughs> and they told me that I should speak about whatever I want to speak about. So uh, I said that's a, always a good thing, which is Greek mythology. And everything I'll be talking about is a single vague metaphor on software development and computer. But at times you'll see that the discourse will verge a bit. The age of heroes is something from an old concept which was developed by these, uh, in particular, these two guys. On the left is Hesiod, and we have no idea what Hesiod looked like, so this is probably not, in fact, the head of Hesiod. And on the right is Plato, and that one should be uh, his real likeness. I mean, he was, the, as you see, uh, a BSD developer with a big beard. And in the Greek notion of the cosmos, uh, the, the whole uh, course of time is a long degradation into the current present, which is the worst time ever. And previous ages were awarded uh, some colors or metals. So the golden age was uh, the, really the place where you had to be. There was no law, no work. Nobody had to work or to suffer. And the first mortals would eventually die by very smoothly. And they could find everything, every food they needed. Then the silver age is a bit worse because <laughs> Uh, then they had to work, they had to do some uh, agriculture because there was still passing of seasons, they had to grow things, but there was no war. Then comes the Brazen Age or Age of Bronze, which is dominated by violence and war, and they eventually killed each other. <laughs> then the Age of Heroes. In the Heroic Age is where all the classic myths about, uh, including the one I will be talking about, take place. So there are normal people, but also heroes, which are uh, not a positive way of talking of people. That's not the modern meaning of the name hero. I come to that. And after the youth age comes now, which is called the Iron Age, uh, which is described by Plato as uh, the age where there is no decency and no more honesty, and everybody is control. So basically, it's now in itself. Uh, this definition is from the Oxford English Dictionary, so it's supposed to be a good dictionary. And there are several meanings to heroes, to the noon hero. But in that case, I'm losing the one, this one, which is a person who is uh, a bit above the humans. In the Greek sense, uh, it's more a question of social hierarchy with the gods on top and the slaves at the bottom. And it's all about getting a bit higher or lower on that scale. And a hero is someone who does things so extraordinary that he is a bit above the normal humans. And not quite a god, but close to it. And that's not necessarily a good person. Uh, now, when you say that somebody is a hero, it's meant as a compliment. Uh, 2,000 years ago, it was not that clear. There is one hero, which is Achilles, and he's the son of a king, a great king on Pegasus, but he's also a demigod, which is even better, from his mother. And uh, he's a, a strong warrior, he's known to be unbeatable. And is rumored to be mostly invisible. He's also predicted to die young, which is kind of contradictory. And he's not extraordinarily smart, but he's uh, very fierce. And uh, he looks like Brad Pitt, which is always nice. And that comes with being with a demigod. And my point is that this guy is a role model for open source software developers not in all these aspects, because uh, he's really a terrible person. And you should not, uh, for instance, treat women like he does. <laughs> but uh, he has, in his behavior, strong traits that really relate to uh, what developers are more or less consciously trying to do, especially open source developers. So a bit of context. 
context is the Trojan War. It's a long story which is uh, recorded in particular in the Iliad, which is a poem by Homer, and that's from the 8th century BC. And supposedly the events, which are mystical, would have taken place <coughs> at the end of the Bronze Age, about uh, 13, uh, 1300 years before Christ, about. And in fact, we did find, it was uh, some uh, archaeologist named Enrich Kiman, who found the ruins of the city of Troy. And apparently, there has been a level of uh, extensive destruction with uh, a lot of fire and looting and so on, about at the right date. So it's quite probable that there was a city named Troy and that they had a war which was famous enough that it's made its way into the mythology. In the, in the myth, it's a long and convoluted story, but it starts, the uh, proximal cause for the war starts with this scene, uh, where the three ladies on the right are basically goddesses. They are Aphrodite, Athena, and Ira. And they have a, a typical uh, cliché of uh, feminine rivalry, and they were in a dispute about knowing who was the fairest of them. And uh, they first appeal to Zeus, and Zeus is not mad, so he decided that he should not choose who is the most beautiful between his own, his daughter, and his wife, because uh, it would not be the smart move, so he decided to delegate, and he talked to Hermes, who is the guy with the wings on the foot, and to find a mortal who would serve as judge, and the mortal on the left is Paris. Paris, at that time, is a, a poor shepherd, but he does not know it yet, but he's also a prince of Troy. He's been somehow exiled because uh, it had been predicted, always with 100% reliability, that he would cause the fall of the city, which was ultimately true. So he was exiled, and while he was just keeping his head, he was summoned by Hermes to be the judge. Uh, of course, the three goddesses tried to bribe him, and uh, Athena, uh, tells him that he, if he chooses her, she will give him a mastery of command that will never do the war. Hera proposes explicit uh, political power to make him the biggest king of all and to have the power of the, the world. And Aphrodite, since she is a goddess of love, says that she, if he chooses her, he will get the love of the most beautiful woman on earth. So, of course, Paris is a teenager, so he chooses Aphrodite. And the most beautiful woman on Earth is very well known. She is Helen, who is the queen of Sparta. And technically also a demigoddess, because she is the daughter of Zeus, which is a rather big man among gods. So, after a number of, of, of things that happened, but it's a very long story, Paris, uh, is recognized as a prince of Troy and is sent as an embassy to Sparta just to, to make peace. And of course, he meets Hélène, and this leads to that, that is, Paris makes off with Hélène. So, depending on who is recalling the story, it's called either uh, abduction or he helps with her, or he, it's not clear whether she was totally willing or unwilling. In that painting, she is uh, rather happy to go with him. And also, he makes off with a substantial part of the Spartan treasure, so this might explain its second thing. So, of course, uh, she is the queen of Sparta because she is married to the king of Sparta, with Menelos, and Menelos is absolutely uh, great with that, so he goes to see his brother Agamemnon. This is an actual uh, historical artifact which has been uh, recovered from the ruins of Mycenae by the same Heinrich Chiman who uh, subsequently discovered the ruins of Troy. And it's called the Mask of Agamemnon, but uh, in all probability it was made 300 years before the birth of any king of Mycenae at the time of the War of Troy. So it's even if Agamemnon existed, it's probably not Agamemnon. But anyway. Uh, Menelaus wants his wife back. And uh, Agamemnon does not really care about Menelaus' wife. 
but he cares a lot about being the biggest king of all and having mastery of the complete agency and especially the commerce inside the agency and uh, the his next competitor on his uh, key list is Troy. So that's a good pretext to organize an expedition, a great war against Troy. So he agrees to that. And we have this project. And this project is to conquer Troy. And with a number of business goals, one is the official pretext, which is to save the owners of Menelos. But uh, so as I said, uh, Agamemnon wants to break the power of Troy. Uh, of course, in any war, there will be a lot of loot. And this is what will bring all the warriors to the war, because uh, each of them wants to get home uh, glorious and rich. So, as the myth goes, uh, they, he succeeded in sending out uh, 1,000 ships full of warriors. In the Iliad, there is a very long in the 24 books, I think. And one of them is extremely long because it's a list of all the ships. And uh, every city will send the ship. So it's, uh, it's known to be interpolated, and uh, there are uh, a few things in that because, uh, for instance, Athena sent apparently no ship at all because it was supposed that uh, when that specific book was uh, put into text, uh, Athens was at war with all his neighbors, so that was some sort of punishment not to include them. But anyway, project is to conquer Troy. And uh, of course, among all the warriors, one of them is Achilles. Achilles has a career goal. And here the point is that Achilles' career goals are not aligned with the business goals. Uh, is, uh, uh, first, he's the son of a king, so he's a prince, and he's already rich. Um, he does not want really to get more riches, because he already has more than he, he needs, more than he can knows what to do with it. What terrifies Achilles is death, but not the suffering of death. That's, he's very, very courageous, very brave. Um, he doesn't really mind being killed. Uh, what terrifies him is the anonymity of death. To, uh, to lose his logos, uh, the, the thing that makes him a unique human being. And he doesn't want to become a shadow who is not distinguishable from other shadows in the, in the other world. So what he wants is to become immortal in some way, but since the really true immortality implies being a, a complete god, not just a demigod, it's out of his reach, so he will choose the next best thing, which is to become extraordinarily glorious, to become immortal in name, so that nowadays, more than 3,000 years afterwards, he will still be remembered. And that part absolutely worked. So that's, that's why he's there. Uh, not for Menelaus' wife, not even for loot, and uh, he's not there to... Uh, to be present to Agamemnon. He does not like Agamemnon. In the regard in the book, not in the movie, uh, I saw a picture from the 2004 movie, which is a nice movie, but the, the book is much better. And, uh, and the book is also absolutely horrible. Uh, I mean, uh, in the movie, I watch it again, there, there are a lot, of, uh, a lot of killing, but there's not even a single beheading. Whereas in the book, uh, there are very graphic descriptions of how internal organs are extracted from people and spread in the field. I mean, I, I, at one point, one of them takes a spear just under his chin, and uh, Homer explains how his teeth are spread out. Uh, that's a true truth. So anyway, uh, in the book, Agamemnon is also a great hero, and he has his own... Uh, moment of glory, which they call the Aristeia, in which uh, he is proven to be a, a very strong warrior, almost equal to Achilles. So, of course, uh, Agamemnon really hates Achilles, and Achilles really hates Agamemnon. And since the, the project does not go well, because 
at the moment the book starts, they are already there for almost 10 years and uh, it does not work. There are 50,000 Greek warriors, they are camping on the beach and there are not enough of them to make a, a full blockade of the city so the city uh, has food and the siege just takes on. So they have a very low morale and at the start of the book they have a plague because they they were bored, so they engaged in some sort of looting in the nearby cities, and uh, one of them uh, hosted the temple to Apollo, and they looted it, and they uh, win the loot who was the Chryseis, who was the daughter of the high priest of Apollo, and then they have a plague, and the god of plague is Apollo, and they had uh, to ask to uh, local uh, divine, uh, to explain them that uh, when you erase the high priest of the god of plague, you may get a plague. <laughs> so, uh, and uh, since the Chryseis was taken uh, as a prize by Agamemnon, the divine whose name is Calcas, I think, said that uh, he had to give it back. And of course, Agamemnon was uh, not very keen of that. But uh, his hands was forced by his uh, warriors, including by Achilles. And Agamemnon had a crude assertion of his own authority to remind everybody that he was the highest king on the place, decided to uh, give back Chryseis, but replace it, replace her. So she's not an object. They treat it as an object, but she's not an object. <laughs> and to replace her with her cousin, who was Chryseis, and who was uh, awarded to Achilles. So, of course, Achilles is deprived of his own prize just because Agamemnon wants to show that he is above him. And as a consequence, Achilles sees his work, and that is, he sees to fight. And when Achilles does not fight, uh, things go really wrong for the Greeks, because then the Trojans become uh, stronger, stronger than the Greeks, and uh, they are there is a whole description of how the Greeks are, uh, have to fall back to their ships and things are, are really not going well. So in the book there are a lot of uh, happenings with the gods who intervene with the total lack of dignity and so on. But anyway, at that time, uh, in fact, the, these things demonstrate that Achilles was the top performer and the business really needs him. Even he himself does not think as being as uh, needed the business. And we arrive to the next episode, which is the death of Patroclus. Patroclus was cousin of uh, Achilles and uh, he suffered to uh, see the Greeks uh, being uh, pushed back by the Trojans. So he decided to go and fight. And he even had a uh, Achilles' blessing, and he tried to fight in the name of Achilles, but uh, he met Hector, who was the big uh, hero in the, on the Trojan side, and Hector was better than Patroclus, and he killed him. So now we see Patroclus was uh, a bit uh, unhealthy in his skin tone. <laughs> and uh, of course, Achilles is very dismayed because that was his cousin, it was his companion, and possibly his cover, because the text is not really clear on that. But anyway, uh, he's, he's very hungry. So when you lose uh, somebody who is close to you, there is a model which is called the, the Kubler-Ross model, in which people will go through these successive stages. First, they don't believe it, they deny the current, and they are very angry. Then there is the bargaining stage where they are trying to trade uh, things with fate. And that's where they would say, they, will, they are trying to invoke gods to say, I'll go in his place and so on. Then they become really depressed. And at the end, over time, they begin to accept that uh, the, the loss and to get better. Now, Achilles is a hero, so it does not follow this model, but what does that one? <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, 
So Achilles uh, becomes very angry, and when Achilles is angry, he kills. And he kills, and more, and more, and hundreds of people, and at some time, another god has to intervene because uh, he's uh, spewing out so much blood that the local river has become just a river of blood. So the god of that river uh, is erased and, and begins to fight Achilles because Achilles is a demigod. He can take on a, a, a real god just on the field, like that. And the whole book is about the to the end of the Iliad, there is just more and more and more murder. And that is uh, one of the characteristics that makes him a software developer. <laughs> So let's see what that means, what that story means for an open source software developer. And open source is an important term here. And when you are trying to write code and you're not paid for that, you're, you're still doing it. So uh, there must be some sort of motivation that powers you. Uh, it's not money, it's that uh, one of them is uh, the, a very Greek notion, which is the necessity for order. Um, most, if not all, of Greek mythology can be interpreted as a long struggle between chaos and order. And the Olympian gods, like with Zeus on their head, uh, arrive at that position by beating the previous uh, deities, the Titans, who were more chaotic. And the Developer who just wants to uh, run a complete project uh, has a notion that there should be good code, and that's what's powerful. And he has a huge dose of hubris. Hubris is a capital sin in the Greek sense. It's uh, when you, since they all, they envision the whole world as everybody having a specific emplacement in the reality. Uh, hubris is when you are trying to be higher than your true place. But you need a bit of ambition. But, uh, and for the developer, the hubris uh, is that they can do it. Somebody is uh, in front of his computer, he has his open, his text editor open, and he tells himself, I can do that. And is an open source developer, so what really, uh, apart from that sense of order, is uh, mm -hmm. not positive. What he will get out of it is the same thing as Achilles. He will get glory. That is by uh, showing his code, he's demonstrating to the world what he can do and how these things are done. So this. These elements might not apply to everybody, but my opinion is that that kind of motivation uh, underlies a good proportion, possibly a majority, of the motivation of open source developers. And these are really in the same vein as Achilles. I mean, Achilles thinks that he is the best warrior because he does not write code, he makes war. But he does it very, very well. And he can do it, and he wants to show to the world how war is to be done. Then there is a big component of hunger. And um, that computer runs Windows, and I cry blood whenever that thing tries to apply updates. I mean, it's, uh, <laughs> it's insufferable. And, the one element of anger uh, comes from the idea that the existing projects are really bad. And there's no, for any specific task, you might say, given operating systems, existing uh, offer is poo. And one very excellent thing, ex ex excellent thing is that a lot of people appear to be content with, uh, even complacent, with the mediocrity of the existing offer. Uh, I mean, a generation of users now have been trained to just reboot and to be happy with that. And if you think about it, uh, that's not a good thing. It should not happen. 
and the anger uh, can power the the envy to fix that and to rewrite everything. And then we see uh, how the good developer, the efficient developer would look like Achilles. That is, once he got to the hunger stage, when he wants things to be done, he will see them through. He won't stop at the end, he won't uh, de be depressed and finally accept. He will go to the end of the project. Uh, if you look at the BSD operating systems, they've been on for 30 years, about, and it's still ongoing. So that means perseverance. And it's an essential quality of a developer, and especially someone who is self-motivated, who just does that for his own glory, is to persevere. Otherwise, nobody will remember his name. So uh, a good developer in that sense must be uh, as thorough and complete than a Greek hero. He must go to the end of things and should uh, never compromise on things and go to the end of every idea. So in order to illustrate that, I will take a perfect example of a hero, that is myself. <laughs> and. Uh, this is probably the reason why I'm here right now, because uh, apparently it got me invited. And uh, my own anger was about OpenSSL. OpenSSL is a library which is well known, is the main open source uh, SSL providing library, uh, and it's used everywhere, including in the BSD systems. And it's known to have had a very long development history from uh, for over 20 years, and they uh, never delayed anything. So it's uh, accreting successive layers of things, and uh, it's a mess, and it's well known. I mean, um, it does not have really, uh, I won't say that it does not have good engineering practice, because it does not have engineering practices at all. Uh, there's a quote in which, in which uh, they say that the first rule of development in OpenSSL is you don't talk about development in OpenSSL. <laughs> <laughs> so since it's a, it's a mess, and yet everybody uses it. So uh, you see the element in which people are a bit uh, complacent with mediocrity. And I told myself there should be good code and I can do it, and I will show to the world how all these things are done. So I decided to write a new library and to, be, uh, to make something which can be shown. Uh, initially, I wanted something such as the source code could be served as a, a tool for uh, explaining how to develop as a pedagogical thing. Also, I wanted it to be extraordinarily light, in, both in RAM usage and code size. And it had to be of high quality, especially the cryptographic implementation. There is something called constant time code, which means that code that is inherently resilient to side channel attacks. And I wanted to have that everywhere. And the last item on the slide, uh, is an important one because uh, what it says is that I decided to do that in early 2015. But the first time I told other people that the project existed was when I published the first public version, and that was almost two years after. So uh, I persevered. I mean, I wanted it to be done, and I kept it for almost two years without external motivation, just to show it. <laughs> so as an example of how these principles of thoroughness apply to technical things, I will go into the technical side of things. In a specific theme, which is how you decode a nested structure. There are a lot of mm, structure more or less complicated in TLS, including the uncheck messages and the X509 certificates. 
And uh, by nested, I mean that each structure contains substructures, which contain sub-substructures, and so on. And one of my goals was to save RAM, so I don't buffer things. Uh, every processing should be streamed in a fixed amount of RAM. So the usual solution to handle the decoding of a complex structure is to buffer the complete message, which uses RAM, and then you have some code which explores iteratively, and every time it enters the substructure, you just open another, another function or uh, another block of code, which uses RAM. And I did not have, in my goals, the RAM to do that. So another solution, uh, which is applicable in some languages, is to have coroutines in which you can have one processing which is uh, recursive with function calling sub-functions and so on, and that consumes input bytes and output the decoded elements. And to be able to operate in a stream fashion, it has to run in its own sort of thread. And there are no coroutines in standard C. You can uh, hack something along with long jump and so on, but first it's horrible, it's fragile, it uses extra RAM, and you should really not do that. So here is an example of one message that should be decoded. It's a client hello in TLS. Uh, what you can see here is that the message itself is a structure with a number of fields, which have subfields, and some of them, uh, the values which are indicated are length. So for instance, you can have uh, an open-ended sequence of extensions up to 64 kilobytes in length. So if you want to buffer <laughs> everything, you have to uh, accept the idea that you, your message may take up to 64 kilobytes, or even more. So my First step was that I wrote, as a prototype, a generic decoder for that, using a template. That is, I had a um, structure in memory, in read-only memory, that describes the structure of a message, and then some code which was looking like an XML sax parser, just to, uh, to read the template as a sequence of decoding instruction and to be restartable whenever it had the new data bytes, and to producing like a small custom coroutine. It worked. Uh, it was not very satisfying, but it so somehow worked. But then, and this is my point here, is that I wanted to, be, uh, to go to the end of that idea. And I recognized that that generic decoder uh, was really a small implementation for a new long programming language. And so, channeling my inner hero, I decided to create a new programming language and write the compiler and just be done with it. And I did. So uh, I decided that this decoding language should really be its own programming. And so I wrote a compiler which is in C sharp and uh, using a force-like syntax because force is relatively easy to do that. To do that. It's extensible. And it allows metaprogramming. And uh, that compiler produces a coroutine. Um, in fact, it produces some, uh, a small interpreter in C, which is resourceable and has its own stack. And it's very light in RAM because the stack uh, is bounded. It contains 17 words of 32 bits. So I'm just using uh, 68 bytes of RAM, which is relatively small. So the code looks like that. So it's a uh, if you have uh, tried to play with the bootloader for FreeBSD, you already saw force code because there is a force interpreter in it. So it looks like that, and it's uh, a bit barbaric and uh, alien, but uh, it's easy to pass because each, basically each word becomes one instruction and in the output becomes one byte of, of code. So this processes alert messages in SSL, and in total, it takes about 40 bytes of code, 40 bytes of form, just to do that thing. So it allows to pack a lot of behavior in a very small amount of code size. 
Thus, to summarize a bit uh, of what uh, a few tips, because uh, since I, I think of myself as a hero, and since I already look like Brad Pitt, I decided that I could give tips. I mean, it's part of the arrogance of the reward to uh, things that you can teach others. And uh, here are my tips, which is for an heroic developer is to consider that every line of code that he writes uh, engages his honor. That is, his glory will be judged by the quality of what he writes. So it's uh, really a matter of maintaining your own standards. You have to be patient, and when you decide something, you have to keep to it, and even if it takes time. So in the Iliad, we see that Achilles has decided that he will not fight for Agamemnon, and he will he effectively stop fighting for about 19 books of the 24. So for 19 books, we see Achilles simply brooding, and a lot of things happen, and he's not taking part, because he has decided to do that, and he keeps to it. And when he decides at the end to go fighting, then he got, he's very soft. He's not doing some small uh, afternoon fighting noise. He's uh, going on a full one page, it's a slaughter. It's, uh, <laughs> and you have to keep learning because you need to, uh, you want to be good at what you do. So uh, you don't stop at some point saying, I know everything, now I can just do it and just live on it. You want to remain keen. So in a warrior metaphor, you want to keep training even when you're not fighting because you're never uh, as good as what you will be afterwards. And you have to know that you must complete your project. Otherwise, you just uh, fall back into the anonymity that terrified Achilles. This is when you complete something, when you formally release the code, that your glory uh, becomes something else than just a dream. Now there is another side of the story, which is what your manager will think of it. <laughs> so, uh, so this story also has tips for uh, what are you going to do with your own hero? And that's Agamemnon's problem because uh, he has that uh, top performer in his team, but uh, that top performer is also a diva, and he must know how to do it. And in the Iliad, we see how Agamemnon manages very poorly. So what you must do when you have a hero on your team is that you must <laughs> understand that you can't really uh, manage him. It's just a... Uh, some sort of uh, ferocious beast that you can unleash on a problem. And your job is to feed him with good challenges, with good problems, so that he, it will keep him occupied. And he will uh, do his stuff properly, but he ha you have to, be, uh, to provide things that he will think uh, fit of his own glory. And you, you won't work if he feels that what you are giving him are too easy and could be done by normal people. He has to be, uh, he has to be praised and to feel that he's recognized to uh, his own view of things. And don't give fake praise because they can smell it. Uh, it, it has to be felt. <laughs> and uh, the last part, uh, Time sheets are an, uh, a good metaphor of uh, administrative tax and heroes don't like that at all. <laughs> so don't, uh, you have to relieve them of anything as mundane, even if it's critical for good business and so on. So the notion for the manager is that if he had no, no hero, managing would be a lot easier, but then he lose the war because uh, the, top, the few top performers are in fact necessary. And this raises the question of uh, whether this will continue in the future. So let's talk a bit about the Iron Age. This is from the SEM and it's from uh, year 2000. 
So they asked themselves a question which was on the air at that time and it's still on the air, which is whether uh, software engineers should uh, be like other engineers, like uh, for bridge building, uh, should there be a license? That is, uh, can everybody just tell, I can do software, let's do it, or should there be some sort of regulation? Because when you have a bridge to build, you are very happy to have some sort of uh, sanction by a state agency that says, oh, this guy really knows how to build bridges. So uh, he will build it and it won't fall down. And there is a, a whole lot of regulation on that. And the question was, would that apply to software engineering? And the SEM in 2000 basically said no. They did not want it because uh, it says that it does not work, that the, the field is too new and there's no good definition of what would make a good software engineer. It's not as, uh, I mean, if you, when you are building a bridge, uh, there are some parts in a bridge, such as the pillars and table and so on. So it's known how a bridge should be built and there is room for innovation. But at least there are some, uh, there is some common knowledge and skills that can be certified and verified. So you can have a notion of a, a build bridging engineer who is good at that and who will give you some guarantees that the work is done properly. And not so much in software, at least in 2000. So the SEM took a stand and said, no, there should not be licensing of software engineering. However, that was a question which was in the air. Who? Ah, uh, yes, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> okay. Uh, Association uh, for Computing Machinery. 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 Okay, so it's uh, one of the big association of uh, software engineers. And uh, another one is the IEEE, who edit standard and who took basically the, uh, the opposite position. So uh, ACM is against licensing and IEE is a poor licensing. So the, the debate is ongoing. That one is from 2004, in which uh, it's just an opinion of some guy, but uh, he writes text about how, uh, again, uh, engineering might be necessary, might like build bridging because it's a good metaphor. Everybody talks about building a bridge. Uh, in some parts of uh, computing, we are talking about cars as the general metaphor, but here it's bridged. And, and then there other people who are keeping on it, and that one is more recent, and it's from 2012, and it's from the IEE, so uh, it's rather the poor licensing side of things. Uh, at that time, there were things that it's coming. The age of, uh, and it's the end of the age of heroes. It means that no more uh, personal hearing for your own glory. People have to be professional and to be registered professionals. So it's uh, the iron age that is looming. But it's not exactly happening right now. And other examples, that one is from Wired, it's also from 2012. And you see the title that regulation is looming and uh, they really think of it as scary. And then another, that one is from communication of the ACM, and the guy was called Laplante, apparently, uh, is some sort of mercenary because he's also part of IEE, and he defends the viewpoint of necessary licensing within the ACM. So the, uh, what these extracts mean is that uh, for the last 15 to 20 years, uh, there have been ongoing discussion of uh, finally coming to the iron age of software engineering and making that a mundane uh, regulated profession like physicians. And it's not really happening in fact. I mean, 
Is any of you a registered licensed software engineer? Not really. <laughs> because it's very hard to define uh, what should be the core skills for a software developer. It's a, not only it's a, new, uh, it's a new field, but it's also changing very fast. There are all sorts of new technologies that come and go. And it's very broad. So uh, you can have somebody who is very good at some specific part of software engineering, but almost nobody is good at everything in software engineering. This one, you should have known it, it's part of the BSD license, and it explains the current position of a software developer. An open source software developer is an artist. He provides things without any guarantee of anything. Uh, I mean, it's not even guaranteed that the code actually exists. And they uh, deny any notion of responsibility. If you have a bridge and it falls down, you can be sure that whoever designed that bridge uh, will get in trouble. If you make some software and there's some uh, security holes which allow the ransomware to spread and uh, causes losses in billions of dollars, no, nobody's fault. And this is even seen, seen in the choice of uh, the legal uh, framework for deciding who gets the glory and uh, the laws on, on copyrights and code are the same laws that for paintings. It's all about an artistic production. So it's not really engineering. At least legally speaking, uh, we're just all artists. So my conclusion is that there is an ongoing push for regulating software development, and it just does not happen because it does not work. You cannot really regulate software and still get the goodies that software provides. You will see some regulations in some specific areas. For instance, when you are doing autonomous cars, then uh, necessarily there are sets of regulation of what's uh, on cars which would apply, but they don't really percolate to the software layer. And because, uh, as insufferable as an arrogant hero can be, uh, you still need him to win the war. That's it. <laughs> Any questions? Hello. Uh, <clears throat> regarding your story on regulation and so on, um, uh, it's been in the in news recently that one of the software engineer at Volkswagen that helped create the software that uh, cheated on the uh, diesel emission tests uh, has been uh, condemned by, uh, by court. So um, this, there is some regulation coming in saying that, okay, you can't just do anything you please and you are somehow responsible for what you're doing. How, wh what yeah. do you think? How does this fit in your uh, story of Harry Cage, Iron Age and so on? It's a uh, there's, a, there's a difference to be made between incompetence and uh, willful malice. That means is not uh, if you make if you write bad code and it just breaks, uh, you you won't get much trouble. But if you are doing something which is uh, fraudulent and you know it, that's how you can get some responsibility. And it's not a regulation of the industry because the uh, notion is not that he was not untitled to do some software engineering, it's that, that he deliberately cheated. And the legal system makes a good difference between cheating and merely uh, being bad at what you do. So in that sense, uh, I don't think that it will uh, really contribute to that notion of regulation because regulation would not have uh, really prevented that. I mean, if you've got a cheater, you can have a regulated cheater. 
he would have his license and it would not uh, still, uh, uh, it would still not prove anything. <laughs> I just wanted to point out that the engineer in question was a manager. He was not a developer. He was one of the top executives of Volkswagen in the USA, and he was sentenced for his role as a top executive, uh, not for his role as, a, as an engineer or software developer. So, yeah. Although this raising the question of what exactly is an amateur in software. I mean, if there's no, no definition of who is a professional, then we are all amateurs. All professionals, but yes, thank you. Yeah, thank you for a nice talk. Uh, just wanted to ask a couple of related questions. First of all, about, about the over engineering, which you know, theorists usually, well, not usually, but sometimes do, <laughs> and uh, about you know, how to manage this, those kinds of things. Because, like, when, when people, you know, some heroes start writing code just to write code, and that becomes a problem. And the second thing is that. Uh, you can't uh, you can win the war without a hero without heroes, but you can't win the war with heroes only. So how to bridge that gap between you know um, the heroes and their work and uh, not heroes and just you know mediocre uh, soldiers who need to work with with the heroes as well, you know and and and, and uh, which who may not have that kind of expertise. Thank you. Okay. Okay, uh, first I must tell that I, I'm not a good manager. So uh, I don't have all the answers on that and I do that anybody really has. Uh, my view is that if you've got uh, your own hero and he goes into uh, too deep heroing, uh, he over engineers things and so on, then your job would be to provide a distraction. That is, if he goes too too long into one path, you have to to send some way to bring it to another into another direction, and that cannot be an assertion of authority because that does not work. Uh, but uh, just like when you have a cat and he's doing something like uh, trying to kill a plant, that a uh, house plant, uh, you bring out a toy just to distract his attention. And uh, that kind of uh, developers with too much in his own ideas, you can steer it by uh, providing a fresh challenge in another direction. And if you provide enough challenges, it won't, it won't really work well with normal workers because in his view, they're all peasants. He does not want to talk to them. But uh, he can be convinced to let, leave them alone and to just uh, let the normal players bask in his radiance uh, as long as you uh, don't give him time to become uh, a really horrible person. Uh, usually the top developers, top performers, some of them are nice human beings, but a lot of them uh, are best kept alone. They produce things and you keep them occupied so that they don't become uh, brooding figures who will then uh, express their anger on their uh, fellow workers. You want them to express their anger on problems. So give them problems and hire normal people to uh, clean up things afterwards. Uh, somehow you, you want a good, painter to, a good painter to make the painting, then normal construction builder to build the house around the paintings. <laughs> okay, we're running out of time, so this is gonna be the last question. Hi, Thomas, thank you for your presentation. I would like to know if you are ultimate dean of Pena regarding the SSL, is the effort to close an open SSL and then burn it down, eventual, and win the war? Uh, sorry, I'm not sure the micro, I didn't uh, really hear the thing. Okay. My question is, is your ultimate deeds of Lala regarding bare SSL to Trojan open SSL and then burn it down to win the war then? Ah. No, I understand that question. Uh, okay, bare SSL is not done yet. I'm still working on it. But at some time, yes, I will take over the world. That's not a question. <laughs> <Wonderful>. Thank you. <laughs> it, it's the point. <laughs> okay, thank you very much.